dia. Creio que ainda há algumas pessoas a chegar, mas vamos tentar manter o horário previsto. Queria dar as boas-vindas em português ao nosso convidado, ao Tom Evermatt. I don't know what's speaking in English. Uh, que a professora Rui Figueiredo irá apresentar, rapidamente. Uh, e queria dizer-vos que esta é a penúltima conferência no programa doutoral em arquitetura contemporânea e que uh, é um gosto imenso, it's a honor, a pleasure to have Tom Haberman with us uh, for the first time here in the school, but not the first time in Lisbon uh, for uh, a lecture. So uh, I hope uh, you enjoy your short stay here and then eventually you can come back soon. And Ruth will present you uh, properly. <laughs> course is structured around present days architectural practice and around the notion of authorship. So it takes advantage from the direct contact with between architects and curators, however providing a critical framework to look at the intentions without the conflicts involved in the process of architectural creative work and participation in the society. So it is our aim that the research work might become instrumental for construction of what will be in the future, the history of the times we are living today. So for this reason, we have been inviting the authors to reflect on the present. Together, they have defined a kind of cartography pointed by their own perceptions of authorship and views of architectural practice and thought. Today, Tom Avermatt is our guest scholar and will look at the notion of authorship, however, under a reverse perspective and beyond the conventional ideas in architectural history suggesting an alternative theoretical framework based on the concept of cross-cultural contact zones. So, architecture has contact zone towards another definition of architectural authorship is the title of Tom Avenard lecture. And it is for me a great pleasure to present, to briefly introduce him. Tom Avenard is a global scholar who has been not only inside of, but also shaping such context zones in architectural history. He is currently full professor at the Institute of History and Theory of Architecture at the ATH Zurich. After his PhD, he became a leader of the Center of Flemish Architectural Archives at the Flemish Architecture Institute, and he was, has been, respectively, associate professor and full professor of architecture at Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. He has held several visiting professorships, among others at the Polytechnic de Milano, Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and University of Copenhagen. Avermaet has a special research interest in the architecture of the city in Western and non-Western context. His research focuses on the changing roads, approaches and tools of architects and urban designers. He is the coordinator of the European research project Communities of Tacit Knowledge, Architecture and its Ways of Knowing. And among his books we can mention another modern, the Paul's War Architecture and Urbanism of Kandilish, Joseph Woods, and Casablanca Shandyard Reports on Modernity. He is also a co-editor of diverse special issues and articles, namely the recently published article Architectural Contact Zones, Another Way to Write Global Histories in the Paul's War Period. So Tom is member of the editorial board of journals such as OAS and the Journal of Architectural Education, as well as a member of the advisory board of Architectural Theory Review and Documental Journal. 
And finally, I would like to mention its curatorial work in exhibitions of very different nature, scale and topics from the global sphere of the Venice Biennale with the, the balcony in 2014 to the CCA gallery um, with a very long, uh, long title, uh, <laughs> which is How Architects, Experts, Politicians, International Agencies and Citizens Negotiate Modern Planning, Casablanca, Chenica. And thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, Roots. Um, thank you to the organizers of this uh, PhD course for uh, for inviting me. It's a very, very big pleasure uh, to uh, to be here, and I hope to exchange uh, with you uh, with you as well. The my lecture of today is called "Architecture as a Complex Zone: Towards Another Definition of Architectural Authorship." And what I will try to do today comes with a sort of disclaimer, I would say. The disclaimer that I'm somebody who doesn't have a design a practice, but who has a research a practice. Somebody who has been doing research for about uh, 25 uh, years at, uh, at, uh, at the moment in this field. And who has, um, sorry, and who has uh, tried to indeed uh, explore different research paths. So what I'm going to share with you today is really, um, I will speak to you as a researcher, a researcher who doesn't have all of the final answers, but the researchers, uh, as, as many of the PhD researchers here, most probably as well, who are still searching to find to how to approach uh, architecture, how to approach urban design in a sensible way, in a nuanced way. This is really the, this is really the, the let's say, the, the point of departure that I'm going to take. And as I said, I mean, I've, I've tried to explore that in several of my, of my, of my works. I would like to start with, uh, with this image. It's an image of uh, architects, urban designers at work, uh, making, designing a project for Boston, Boston, Cambridge in the, in the US. And what I like about this picture is that you clearly see that this project for Boston is not designed by a single architect, by a single urban designer, but that the project of, 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 for Boston is the result of a negotiation an appreciation that one architect is making, that another one is making, a decision that one urban designer is making, that another is taking, and together this is, uh, is forming this, this urban project for the city, of, uh, for the city of, uh, of Boston. The same thing can be said when we look at, uh, at this uh, image. This is an image of Atelier Bauer using this idea of the drawing as something that is negotiated between different, uh, between different actors in their, studio, in their studio education. Again, looking upon a project uh, for the city as something that is the result of several students working together, making decisions, uh, deciding upon, upon certain paths uh, to follow, deviating, uh, deviating from that. Again, a whole set of, of negotiations which are going on and which create, in the end, a project uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the city. In other words, what I would like to get across to you is that architecture, as we know, is always what I would call a negotiated matter. A negotiated matter, something that is negotiated between different actors. A negotiated matter, something that is negotiated between various issues that are at stake, interests, uh, ambitions, and so on. A negotiated matter which has to do with numerous, numerous practices. And we can say this the moment that we design the project, but we can of course say that for all of the stages of architecture between design and realization, always it has to do with the multiplicity of actors, with the multiplicity of interests, with the, with, with the multiplicity of uh, decisions that, that are taken. And in the end, the sum, I would say, of all of these negotiations creates an architectural project or an urban, or an urban design uh, uh, project. So strangely enough, I think that all of us recognize that reality. It doesn't matter if you're in research or if you're in design practice, realizing buildings or only doing competitions. We, we recognize this, this idea of architecture as a negotiated matter. 
But strangely enough, we recognize this in reality, architecture as a negotiated matter, but when we go to our research, we tell very simple stories. Stories where architecture is not a negotiated matter, but is something that depends on one heroic single altar, one heroic single architect, who is apparently as a sort of deus ex machina, deciding upon what an architectural project is, how it comes into being, and so on. I'm showing you here a few almost classical, uh, classical examples, I would say, of how we've looked in, in more historical research upon authorship, in, uh, in, uh, in architecture. So, authorship has something that has to do with a single, uh, with a single author. Authorship in, in architecture has something that has to do which mainly plays at the level of the design, as if a building or if a project stops the moment that the design, uh, the design is there. So, the way that we've been looking in, in our research to authorship is very much, authorship is also always about the conception, about the initial design decisions that are taken, Forgetting that authorship continues, of course, in the realization of the building, in the appropriation of the building as well. This is a very nice example. We will talk more about Chandigarh in a, in a while, but this is, of course, Le Corbusier standing there with his big plan of, uh, of uh, Chandigarh and some, some kind of modular, as you can see, above the plan as well. Or, I think that when we speak about authorship in our research, that we very often make very simplistic relations between a set of ideas, a set of theoretical explorations, and the building there, as if there is a sort of linear relation between these, as if the authorship is mainly here, and the building just simply follows that, uh, that authorship as well. I consider that quite problematic, I must say, that we are dealing with architecture as a negoci negotiated matter in reality, but the moment that we look in our research, I think we reduce architecture to what I would call a very schematic matter. By schematic, I mean sim simplistic, uh, focused on a single author, focused on thinking only that, is a, that it's only about design, and focused on an idea that architecture is all about devising concepts, uh, let's, uh, let's say. So I think we felt in our research for a too long time an extremely simplistic uh, idea of what authorship in, uh, in architecture, in architecture uh, means. And so, for me, uh, the, the, question, the, question, uh, the question that I've encountered as a researcher what will, would be an alternative way of thinking about this, uh, of thinking about this authorship, of dealing with, with this authorship? An alternative way that is maybe closer to this reality of architecture as a negotiated matter. That's really one of the challenges that I encountered myself as a researcher. And for me personally, one uh, big field of thinking that has been very important in thinking this authorship differently is the field of thinking which we call post-colonial theory. Now don't mistake, post-colonial theory is not a field that deals exclusively with decolonizing countries. It's a bigger field of, a bigger field of thinking, a field of thinking that is, for instance, uh, let's say, articulated by people like this uh, Palestinian intellectual, Edward Said, who wrote this very important book. I'm sure that many of you are, are, are familiar with that, uh, Orientalism in which I think that uh, Said is, is talking uh, indeed about how certain cultures are constructed. And for me, this idea of, of thinking about how certain cultures are constructed was also something that I thought that, we, that I could project on architectural culture. The idea of, of, of indeed an, an architectural culture or an idea of authorship being a construct, not something that is there, but something that we construct, let's say, has been for me very important. So what Zaid is saying, that is, that is indeed, he's speaking about the Orient, for instance, that the Orient is a construct, he is saying, but he's also saying, I think that we can, could also, let's say, project it on architecture. What, what we understand as practice is a construct uh, as well. A construct that we, as researchers, as architects, as professors, as students, we construct, as it, as it were. What is architectural practice? Who has agency in practice uh, as well? So for me, people like Said were important to, uh, to deconstruct it. 
Also, what Said is underlining is that such a notion of what architectural practice and by extension architectural authorship is, is something that is very, very persistent. It's part of our culture. That is how we understand authorship. That is how we understand uh, practice. And we can see it in, in various texts, in expressions. That is what, what Said is, is saying. And Said is also saying, and here comes the critical thing, that it's also oppressive. And what, what, what does Said mean by this being oppressive? That is pushing away other notions of authorship, other notions of what practice uh, can, be, uh, can be about. So for me, this was very, very critical, reading Said and understanding with a bit of effort that we can also project this on architectural culture and that it in some kind of way forces us to understand that there are dominant conceptions of authorship and of practice and that we, in some kind of way, that these dominant uh, uh, conceptions of authorship of, and of practice, they are pushing away other conceptions of authorship, other conceptions of practice. This is Said, I mean, one more uh, theoretical venture and then I will go. Uh, the, other, the other person that was very important for me is Frans Fanon. Uh, Frans Fanon was also somebody, his most, most important book is The Wretched of the, of the Earth. And he's, he's also speaking about this idea of how cultures can be oppressive. I'm sure that, you also, that many of you also know uh, Franz uh, Fanon. And what is, what is interesting is that Fanon is saying that those people who write histories, and I'm extending that to those of us who, who are critics, uh, let's say, that they are complicit of, of, these, uh, of, these, uh, of keeping these notions of authorship these notions of a, part a particular understanding of practice uh, alive. So this complicitness that was for me also almost as a mirror, I must say, for somebody who is a researcher, that I understood, well, when I'm doing research and I'm uh, let, uh, articulating a particular conception of authorship or of practice, I'm as a researcher complicit in uh, confirming this conception of, of practice as well. I hope you, you follow how, but I, I think it's important that I tell that to you. So, a whole, this, I mean, for those of you who are interested in this field of post-colonial theory, it's a very, very rich uh, uh, field. Here I'm showing you some of the big uh, reference works of, of, of post-colonial theory. Um, the one of, uh, um, of Williams and, and Chrisman was very important, also the one of Ashcroft, Ashcroft and, and Griffiths, very important works, who ask us or who challenge us, who challenge us, and I'm saying us as researchers uh, right now, to go beyond these dominant conceptions of authorship, of practice, that's at, that's at least what I feel that they are uh, uh, doing. Huh? So the persistence of these dominant discourses is, is, is very important, but also the fact that we are, that it is possible for us as researchers to create another sort of, uh, another sort of knowledge. So for me, post-colonial theory is on the one hand telling us about how problematic our conceptions of authorship and of architectural practice are that we hold in the research. And on the other hand, it's inviting us, I would say, to come up with other narratives, other ways of approaching uh, authorship and, uh, and agent and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and architectural practice. And that's what I'm going to suggest to you, uh, that's what I'm going to suggest to you today. What I'm going to suggest to you is, and that is, of course, I'm also saying that for the students, only one suggestion amongst others. I mean, this is my suggestion uh, to you. I hope that you take it in that sense as well. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest to you is that we can look upon architecture as what I call a contact zone. And a contact zone is a notion that is introduced by a literary scholar, Marie-Louise uh, Pratt, who already a long time ago, in 1991 right now, wrote an article, The Arts of the Contact Zones, and she said, contact, zone, contact zones are spaces where different, disparate cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and of subordination. So what Marie Louise Pratt is saying, there is something like uh, what she calls a contact zone, where different cultures, think cultures of commissioning, cultures of designing, cultures of craftsmanship, they meet 
and they encounter one another, not as equals, because there, 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 are, there, are, there are ideas of, of domination, but nevertheless, Marie-Louise Pratt looks upon these complex zones as very productive zones. Zones where things happen, where things are shaped, where innovation is, is taking place. That's what she's saying about these, uh, about these complex zones. And what I'm trying to suggest to you is what would happen if we start to look upon uh, architecture as indeed a series of complex zones. So not understanding architectural culture any longer as focused on these single authors, but understanding architectural culture as something that is propelled by these context zones. That's what I'm going to suggest to you today. And I'm not going to do that theoretically, but I'm going to do that by showing my own work, how I as a researcher dealt with this question of, uh, of, of context zones. And I will be talking about three ways of looking upon architectural culture as, as context zones. And the first way that I'm going to, the first uh, context zone that I'm going to talk about is indeed a, that architecture can be looked upon, or architectural culture can be looked upon as a context zone between different actors. In order to illustrate, uh, in order to illustrate my point, I'm reminding you one more time about the tradition uh, that we have in, in, our, uh, in our field. Uh, we used to look upon uh, architectural culture as something that is propelled by single, heroic, very often male actors. That's, that's the dominant, that's the canonical understanding of architectural culture. This is an example, it's a book of 1963, uh, where indeed uh, the whole architectural culture is about modern masters, as you can, as you can, as you can see uh, here. So, in principle, of course, there is nothing, there is nothing wrong by focusing on one, single, on one single actor. Many of you might know this book, this is the, the, the prime example of what we call micro-history, it's Carlo Ginsberg, of course, The Cheese and, uh, and, and the Worms. And what, what, what Ginsberg is doing in that book is showing that by looking at a single actor, you can look at, a, at, an, at an entire world. A miller who has never left his, left his uh, mill, and we can look at it uh, and, and, and understand the, the, the wider world. But I think that in architectural culture, there is something else at stake. That these single modern masters, they're giving all of the agency. It's them who are propelling architectural culture. And I think that that is in some kind of way even uh, differentiating from, uh, from Ginsburg. So when we started this project, the project that I did together with Maristella Cachato, the, the project Casablanca Shandiga, which we did between 2012 and 2015, we were indeed thinking about how will we deal with, uh, with authorship, with uh, how can we look upon Casablanca and Chandigarh in a different way. Why was that necessary? Because the, uh, when we looked, for instance, as, at the city as uh, Chandigarh, the canonical uh, understanding, the canonical narrative of Chandigarh was very simple. The canonical narrative was that this big man, Le Corbusier, arrived on the, on the site surveyed the site, photographed the site, uh, then came up with a very smart system of uh, sectors, uh, as, as, you can, as you can see here, which were going to determine the entire layout of, uh, of uh, Schandigar, then came up with a very uh, uh, elaborate system of uh, circulation, the 7V seven, the seven system, then even himself designed these uh, uh, epitomes of modern, uh, of modern Indian uh, architecture, the courthouse, uh, the, the, assembly, the assembly hall for the new, for the new uh, city of, of Punjab. In other words, the canonical narrative was a narrative where Le Corbusier, as a, as a heroic <coughs> male architect, had decided everything. That's the narrative of Shandigar. I'm, I'm challenging you, try to look in your history books, and that's more or less the, the history that will, be, uh, that will be told. And our question was then subsequently, what would be an alternative narrative? And the moment that we started to do research, we started to, in some kind of way, see a different reality, the reality of a contact zone, I would say. First of all, the reality of a contact zone between Le Corbusier and his nephew, Pierre Jean de Ré. Pierre Jean de Ré, who had been living in Chantigar for a very long time, on site, while Le Corbusier was flying, flying in and out, and had been there and 
in some kind of way living living the life uh, uh, living the life there and encountering the local uh, the local people the local uh, understanding the local issues that, that were at stake so Chandigarh, not as the, as the story of this single heroic architect, but at least uh, taking his uh, nephew into, into consideration as well. But we also started to understand that Chandigarh was of course not only the product of architects, but also of very, very strong politicians. Here we see of course Nehru, the first uh, president of independent, uh, of independent uh, India, who was indeed one of the main thinkers of this new city, had been laying the foundations uh, for this new city as well. So Chandigarh is a contact zone between different architects, but also Chandigarh is a contact zone between architects and, 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 and politicians. Chandigarh is a contact zone of Le Corbusier's uh, ideas, this high, uh, this, this is uh, architect of the modern movement, but also as a contact zone of different sorts of expertise. Amongst others, the expertise on tropical architecture, which was very important at the time, which suddenly, which suddenly was brought into Chandigarh by these two people, Jane Drew and Axel Fry, uh, two people who brought a new set of knowledge uh, into, the, into the equation as well. So Chandigarh as a contact zone between politicians, between international architects, Le Corbusier, Jean de Rey, uh, Jane Drew, Maxel, Maxel, uh, Maxel Fry, but Chandigarh also, of course, as a contact zone with local architects. Many, many Indian architects were working in the so-called architect's office in Chandigarh. Amongst others, the first Indian architect, Elisha Buri, who, is, who, who, who you can see in the, in the, uh, on the screen to, to the right, which was also part of this, uh, of this, uh, of this contact zone. So already uh, opening up this, uh, this uh, looking upon Chandigarh, not as the work of this single heroic architect, but indeed as this contact zone, changed our, uh, our, uh, our perspective quite a lot. Many architects, international and local architects, politicians, and then of course we started to realize that of course also other people were, were part of that contact zone. People who were, for instance, craftsmen. The, the area around Chandigarh was, a, was, a, was an area where brick, build, brick burning was a very important uh, aspect. And in relation to that brick burning in field oven, ovens, there was a very strong craftsmanship uh, locally, uh, there, uh, locally there as well. The craftsmanship, which you see here, where people could do with simple bricks quite elaborate, uh, quite elaborate uh, uh, forms. Oh, sorry, I'm going backward. And here you see how, of course, this contact zone is not only a contact zone of architects, but also of these craftsmen, men and women, uh, who were building this, uh, this, new, uh, this, new city, uh, this new city as well. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the moment that we now start looking back at, uh, at Chaldigar, we start understanding these, uh, uh, these typologies, that we start to understand, for instance, the importance of this brick craftsmanship when we look at these modern, uh, at these modern typologies. Or that we understand that uh, people like Pierre Jeanneret were, for instance, aware of the fact that sleeping in the Indian context is not happening in the interior, but a large part of the year at the exterior, at these, com at these terraces, these discreet these uh, 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 terraces. Or that we understand that, of course, some of the housing, the, the, the housing which on the one hand was housing low-rise but high-dense housing, echoing experiments in Scandinavia, I think, for instance, about Arne Jacobsen, was echoing with this international field. But on the other hand, when we look at the thresholds in this housing, that they had to do with this local way of living, this local way of practicing these, uh, uh, these houses as well, as you can see here, where these thresholds, they are, they are there for mediating between the public space and the private space of the house. Or that we understand that this knowledge, this of, of tropical architecture, which had to do with cross-ventilation and shadow, suddenly was introduced in the way that, that walls were built in Chandigarh as well. These are these so-called self-shadowing uh, walls, where through a very smart brick pattern, think about the craftsmanship, suddenly a very clim climatologically sound uh, uh, building element is, uh, is, is produced, uh, is produced um, as well. 
So what we try to do when we were, when we were uh, investigating Chandigarh is indeed to look upon a project as, as Chandigarh, not as the outcome of this single male heroic uh, architect, actor, but indeed understanding the multiplicity of actors that was, that was involved in that, um, were involved in that, amongst others, by making these kind of schemes. This is, this is the scheme of Chandigarh, trying to understand all of the actors involved in the realization of this. This is the scheme of, uh, of Casablanca, and which we were trying to, uh, were trying to compare it. Of course, saying that uh, architecture or an architecture or an urban project like Chandigarh is a contact so, of different actors comes also with a set of challenges. Because the easy thing is, of course, to follow the archive of the single male heroic architect, take out the plans out of Le Corbusier's archive and write uh, that history. A completely different uh, question is indeed how to get the sources and the knowledge of all of these different, uh, of all of these different actors. That's something that I also encountered in another research project where we were working mainly on, on Casablanca. This is the project which, of, of, that I explored in the book Colonial Modern. And in this book we were looking at these uh, post-war, 1940s, 1950s, extensions of, uh, of, of Casablanca. And there again, the easy thing was of course to tell this story from the perspective of the main urban planner. The main urban planner was this man, which you see to the right hand side, Michel Ecochard. Michel Ecochard was, was in charge of the so-called Service de l'Urbanisme, and they were planning, let's say, these, uh, uh, these uh, neighborhoods. We could easily find uh, material on Michel Ecochard. Here we started to understand how Michel Ecochard uh, engaged with the colonial administration, the colonial politicians, the colonial leaders, as you can see, which were also military leaders, in order to already start to establish this project as a contact zone between architects and politicians, uh, let's say, as well. But much, much more difficult was to bring these kind of actors into the equation. The people who were, for instance, constructing these, uh, these neighborhoods, or the people who had been living and transforming in these, uh, in these uh, neighborhoods, because they didn't have official archives, they didn't have uh, official documents uh, left. And so what we did is, and, and that's for me part of constructing these contact zones, is that we then had to go to a whole set of other documents. For instance, documents of the Liberation uh, Party. So when we were looking at the story of, of Michel Ecochard, and the, the French politicians, the, these neighborhoods, they were all about bring, being, bringing uh, modernity to the people, bringing well-being and welfare to the people as well. But when we started to look at the documents of the, of the Freedom Party, the Istikal Party in Morocco, we saw a completely different uh, story emerging. A story of oppression, uh, uh, for instance, as well, where these neighborhoods, they were read, as uh, oppressive uh, uh, ventures, as uh, attempts to discipline the people of, of, of Morocco by giving them certain uh, living spaces. So just to show you that, of course, there are uh, quite a bit of challenges the moment that you want to construct such a, such a, a contact zone. So the first contact zone that I wanted to get across to you is this contact zone where indeed we don't look upon architectural culture any longer as something that is pivoting around a single architect, but at least understanding architectural culture as contact zones of different actors. That's the first contact zone that I would like to get across. The second contact zone that I would like to get across is more a contact zone that focuses on what I would say, not actors, but what we call in English agencies. Who has an agency in the built, uh, in the built environment? In other words, who is intervening in the built environment, who is shaping uh, the, built, uh, the built environment? And there I think for me what was always very uh, 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 helpful is Henri de Favre's uh, work, La Production de l'Espace, where he's uh, speaking, of course, about these notions of conceived, 
lived and perceived space. These are the English translations of the notions. The Fevre is, of course, writing in, uh, in French. But of course, what is important in, in Le Fevre's work is that he's making a clear distinction between conceived space. There we could, we could say the work that architects, urban designers are doing, the big uh, ideas, the big conceptions about space and in some kind of way confronting that with what he's calling lift and perceived space, which is the, the, the space and the agency of other actors in the built environment. For instance, those who are living these, uh, living these built environments. So for me, uh, in order to think a con uh, contact zone of indeed conceived and lift uh, uh, agencies, I think that Lefebvre was very important. Just to give you a few other references, somebody that was also very important is the, uh, the anthropologist Ariana Padurai, who speaks about the social life of things and who is also speaking about how these different agencies uh, they, uh, they work. And the last one, just to give you a few uh, references, is Pierre Bourdieu, who's also, sp who's also speaking about these different, uh, different agencies. I'm not going to go into detail, but I hope to explain it to you. So with this in, in the background, I, start, we, uh, I started to look at uh, in another project. This is the project, the so-called Lift-In project. I started to look at uh, how the relation, how architecture can be looked upon always as a relation, a contact zone between conceived and lift uh, spaces. And I did that in um, a set of well-known cities, Brasilia, post-war cities, Casablanca, Chandigarh, you've already seen, La Courneuve, Berlin, and Chatham. These were, the, uh, these were the, 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 the cities that I looked upon. And what I, the, the, the point of departure here was that these cities that had been uh, constructed, they had been realized, but that there were other agencies that had been taking place in the five decades that they had existed. So it was always about understanding the relation between these conceived uh, spaces and these lift, uh, these lift spaces, the plant and the lift. And here I'm showing you how I approached it as a researcher. Uh, I approached it in what you're looking at is the plan of an exhibition space here. A ground plan of an exhibition space. These are the different cities. And, and these different cities, they, they were always approached from two angles. On the one hand, from the lift, uh, the lift spaces, from when you approach it from this angle. And on the other hand, from the conceived, uh, from the conceived spaces, when you approached it from this angle. And the idea was that indeed somewhere in the middle, this relation between conceived and lift, they would, would be established. So how did this look? Here you see how, how, this, uh, how this looked. Uh, always uh, starting one side was the more conceived spaces, and the other side was the more, was the more lift spaces. In order, again, to not understand the architecture as only something that has to do with this conceived uh, idea, but something that is, also, that is also lift. So just to give you a few impressions. So, yeah. And here you see, for instance, that meant for a city like Casablanca, that we were speaking about these big conceived spaces. This is what this urban planner, Michel Ecochard, was doing, making a grid structure, conceiving the city as a grid structure. Uh, realizing, realizing that grid, sorry, realizing that grid structure. That's what you see, what you see here. But also, we were also telling them the the story of the lift spaces, how people started to change that grid structure. First, in a very elemental uh, way, very very light way, you could say. But then, in a much more strong way, by extending these courtyard houses in a vertical, in a vertical way. Here you see some of the principles, starting from, uh, starting from, uh, I don't know if there's a point here, yeah. starting from this and ending in this, in, this kind of, uh, in this kind of condition and resulting in the city of Casablanca as we know it nowadays. So the city of Casablanca is indeed a result of the relationship of the contact zone between these conceived and these lift agencies, I would, uh, I would say. 
We did the same with cities like Shandiga, and I'm going to go a bit uh, faster, where again we spoke about what the architects had been putting in, in place, how they had been putting what they call controls, and then also looking very, very closely how in the, the lift spaces people had been changing, uh, changing parts through, uh, through photography. Again, understanding this contact zone between the conceived and the lift uh, spaces. Same for Brasilia, uh, again of course Kubicek and Lucio Costa. You know the story of the big, of the big super quadras and then understanding the conceived, the conceived uh, uh, spaces here, but then also looking closer and understanding how these conceived spaces, they interact, they create a contact zone with these lift spaces and that's what the city is, is about. It's not only the conceived, it's not only the lift, but it's the relation between the two which is making uh, the city. Same for Berlin Banzan. Berlin Banzan was one of these extensions of, of Berlin uh, by Honecker, uh, introduced by Honecker. This is the conceived city, of course. And then we started to look at the interiors of these, uh, of these apartments and we saw how this conceived very, very radical uh, uh, elements were indeed complemented, as it were, by uh, these uh, this lift uh, uh, spaces. And the last, the last city that we looked upon was the city of Shetten, where the architects and the urban designers, they had already taught from the very beginning of this relation between the conceived and the lift. And they, so this is this area of Shetten. It's also one of these low-rise extensions of Oslo in, uh, in uh, Norway. And the way what they did there is that they made a manual, a so-called handbook, where the, the conceived and the lift, they were from the beginning taught simultaneously. And where people were given the opportunity to extend, transform their houses with a manual that was in each and every single house. So from the very beginning, looking upon architecture as this contact zone between the conceived, the conceived and the lift. I'm going to my third and last uh, contact uh, zone uh, then. And my third and last contact zone, that's really a contact zone where I would like to talk about uh, the agency of the artifact, I would say. This, because I think very often in our, in our uh, research, we are talking about the agency of the architect, we are talking about the agency of the inhabitants, of the politicians, of the engineers and so on. But surprisingly to me, I think that we very often forget about the agency of the artifact as, uh, as such. And so, what I'm going to suggest to you is that when we look upon architecture, that we should look upon it as a contact zone between what I'm calling discursive and embedded hypothesis. That's the last contact zone that I want to talk about. And the reason that I want to talk about is because in many of our research and in many of our discussions of architecture, we make, we focus on what I would call discursive hypothesis. What do I mean by a discursive hypothesis? These hypotheses that are written down in texts. Very often what we do is we look into the theories of an architect, the Corbusier urbanisme, and then we try to recognize these theories in the built world. That's a very normal, uh, <laughs> I would say, thing to do in, uh, in research. I'm, 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 calling, I'm calling this a focus on discursive hypothesis. Discursive hypothesis, I mean meanings attributed to the built environment, expressed in verbal form or in figures or graphics by scholars, critics, decision makers, designers, developers, practitioners. So I think we have an, an, over, an, an, an over focus, a too strong focus on what I would call these discursive hypotheses in research. And what I'm suggesting to you is of course we need to look at these discursive hypotheses, what the designer has been written, writing about the project, what the engineer has been saying about the project, what the politician has uh, uh, as uh, projected on the, on, on the project, they are important. But I think that there is in, in, in architecture a whole set of different hypotheses. A whole set of different hypotheses, which I call embedded hypotheses. And by embedded hypotheses, I mean those assumptions, those ideas, those conceptions who are not written down in text by the architect, not by the engineer, not by, but who are in some kind of way part 
of the specific temporal and spatial ordering of the material artifact. That's what I'm calling embedded hypothesis. And I think that when we look at architecture, that we should always look simultaneously, that's my own personal idea, simultaneously to these discursive hypotheses and these embedded hypotheses. I think there is so much to learn from these embedded hypotheses that we, as architects, by closely studying the, the artifact, can learn from the artifact without finding it in a text, without finding it in a diagram that is made by the, by the designer, for instance. And in order to illustrate that, I'm taking you for a moment to another research project that I did, and this is a research project on the French, southern French city of Marseille. Uh, you're looking here at the harbor of, uh, of Marseille. And I want to focus on this project. It's a project by Fernand Pouillot, the French architect Fernand Pouillot, and René Eguerre, <coughs> and it's the so-called, sorry, I mean, uh, it's the so-called uh, La, La Tourette housing project. And this Latourette housing project, there were a lot of discursive hypotheses about this uh, Latourette housing project because it was part of the reconstruction of Marseille. So it was on the one hand part of reconstructing the city. Marseille was quite heavily uh, demolished in the Second World War as well. So the, the discursive hypothesis is this was about reconstructing the city. Or another discursive hypothesis about this project was it was about bringing welfare to the, uh, to the people. It's part of the post-war welfare state. These were the discursive hypotheses. And obviously they're important as as discursive, uh, as discursive hypotheses. But I think that we can see other things when we look at, at the artifacts. So when we start to look at this project, we start to understand that the project of La Tourette is, uh, is realized simultaneously with another very important project in Marseille, namely the Unité d'Habitation by, uh, by, Le, by Le Corbusier and his atelier. And what, to me, one way to look upon the project of La, of La Tourette, you see the La Tourette project here, is that it's of course suggesting a completely different urban model. It's not the urban model of the single building in the wide uh, landscape public space, but it's an urban model which tries to continue the city. So this is one thing never said about this project by Pouillon, but something I think that we can read from plans as, uh, as, this, uh, as this plan or by simply looking very, very closely to the urban artifact, where we understand that Pouillon is working with the modernist typology of the tower and the slab, but not doing that in isolation, but as part of a bigger urban, uh, urban formation. That's what I'm calling an embedded hypothesis about urban space, about what urban space is about. So, well, I, think you, I think you get the idea. But also, when we, when we look very closely to the artifact, we see that in the, in the work of Pouillon and Eger, there is also an understanding of reinterpreting classical architectural elements. Elements, for instance, like the arcade, which was for many uh, modern movement architects, not something that you would, would be working with because this belonged uh, to history. Here we see that there is an attempt to make a reinterpretation of these, uh, of these elements. But nevertheless, doing that in combination with a modernist slab and a modernist, uh, and a modernist uh, uh, tower. Or uh, reintroducing ideas about composition, about architectural composition. I think you can see here, I mean, when we look at the, the composition of these types of buildings, their, their layeredness, the way that, uh, that, that this whole composition is, is, is constructed is quite uh, sophisticated, using elements from maybe even neoclassical elements and, ma and making, a making a reinterpretation of that as well. Doing that, again, by combining it with the modernist typology of the tower, of the tower block. Also, when we look very close at this, at, this, uh, at this artifact, we see that it's also a redefinition or, a, or an embedded hypothesis about the construction methods. Le Corbusier was, of course, with Unité d'Habitation, making a big uh, a plea to use concrete, rough-casted uh, rough concrete. Um, Pouillot is doing something very different, something that they call Pierre, uh, Pierre Banchet. 
and the Pierre Barche is using natural stone, which was at the time easier to get than reinforced uh, concrete. And here you can see using using natural stone as a covering for a con for concrete uh, for concrete walls. So here again, by looking closely at the artifact, we understand. Here you see this uh, covering. We understand how uh, how indeed this artifact is embedding an hypothesis of how to build, with which materials to build, how to build cheaply, not through rough casted concrete, but indeed with this Pierre Branche uh, technique. And last but not least, when we look at this uh, project of, of Puyo and Eger, we see that it's also an attempt to redefine monumentality and borders between the public and the private realm, using, these, using elements that were very unusual in modern architecture, like these claustras, which come from, uh, uh, which come from uh, the non-Western uh, world, but which are nevertheless incorporated in these modernist slabs and, uh, and typologies, or introducing an, an another sort of idea of monumentality, I would say, all together uh, as well. So, well, I think what I, what I try to show to you, and I hope that I get that across, and I, I, I hope that we can further discuss this in the, in the, in the question Q&A round afterwards as well, is that I believe that looking upon architecture as a contact zone in the three ways that I've shown to you does allow us to go beyond this idea of single altars, one, allows us also to go beyond the idea that architecture is an exclusive matter of designers, but also indeed in, include the conceived and the lived spaces, and also to go beyond, beyond the idea that architecture is a fully conceptual matter. Architecture is also about the artifact. It's as much about the discursive hypothesis, which I would equal with the conceptual method, as it is about these embedded hypotheses, which are embedded in the artifact and which are not explicitly articulated. So my invitation to you and, uh, is, is indeed to maybe, just as me, as a researcher, give it a try and indeed look upon architecture as a contact zone, a contact zone of multiple actors and actions, a contact zone of conceived and perceived spaces, and a contact zone of discursive and embedded hypotheses. I think that if we start to look upon architectural culture as a set of contact zones, that other narratives, other actors, other agencies, they come to the surface and they allow us to tell a story about architecture that is not a schematic story, but a story that is close to reality. Thanks. Thank you, Tom Amberman, for this very inspiring uh, lecture. Uh, so we'll now open the debate. So if somebody would like to share a reflection, a question, some ideas, just put your hands up. While you think... I can start. Okay, or I can... Yeah. I can. Oh. So then we start with the student. Good morning, I'm a, I'm a student. Uh, talking about these subjects subject and the game is about working with uh, other identities to work uh, to solve a problem. But I think it's very interesting when different identities like art and design are working together to solve a problem. In this case, a urban typology project. Uh, how, do we, how do we come to choose the right identities to work with? And how do we deal with this idea of hierarchy, I mean, different levels, How it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better if all these different identities had, had this, the same, no. the same, yeah, yes, is that? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, personally, I think that uh, in a, in a, let's say, in architectural culture, that uh, when, we, when we work with these different uh, actors, uh, let's, let's call them, and that's the first contact zone that I was talking about, I don't think that these that they, they, these are ever equal. I think that the processes that we engage with are unequal processes where sometimes maybe architects are in charge, at other moments uh, politicians are in charge, at other moments engineers are in charge. So I'm not so much in favor of, uh, of, of thinking all of these actors as, as equals. 
what I do think that we need to do, and let's say you're asking how do we choose, how do we select in some kind of way these actors, I'm looking upon it for me, uh, we, we're working a lot, I didn't tell too much about it, but we're, we're working a lot with this idea that in order to construct a contact zone, you need to cross histories, we're calling it. We are of course working with the history of architecture and we are looking upon it right now almost as an imperative to us as researchers that we never tell the story of a single actor. We always want to cross uh, 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 stories in order to create a context. So it's almost, now I'm going to, it's a bit, uh, let's say, forceful maybe, it's almost an, an ethical imperative to us as researchers, never, never, I'm also telling to my PhD students or to my colleagues in, in the chair, never, never tell this single story, because architecture is not about that single story, that's something that, that's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's incorrect, it, it doesn't, it doesn't show also the complexity of our discipline, I think, either, because much of the complexity of our discipline is indeed about these contact zones, is about the negotiations between different uh, actors, the negotiation between conceived and perceived spaces, the negotiation between uh, uh, discursive and, and, and embedded hypotheses. So, uh, I mean, there is no recipe to, to select, uh, but there is a sort of ethical imperative to always cross, uh, to always cross uh, histories. And that's for me something that we also wrote in the, in the article that I shared with one of your uh, professors where we're speaking about this context zone as a new way of doing research, as a new way of writing histories. I am convinced indeed that we need to do this much, much more in order to yeah, give a good reflection of the complexity of our discipline. We, we have an enormously complex uh, discipline and I think we need to uh, show that, unpack that also in our, in our research, I would say. Is this a, okay. Well, I would like to thank you for your lecture because it was, I think, very enlightening and especially in what concerns to the context of our PhD where, in fact, we are analyzing some uh, works, mainly, well, our PhD is about uh, contemporary architecture, so we are trying to deal with this uh, of, uh, analysis of what is happening, what or what exactly. has just happened some moments before. Yeah. So it's about the history of the present, which yeah. is somehow um, very uh, difficult to uh, better understand the way that it has been. It mm. has to be uh, dealt with. And in fact, the, the thing that I would, well, I was I would like to add to this history that yeah. you were. Uh, telling us is in fact because we are mostly dealing with uh, or with living authors that uh, want to tell a story yes. so that's one thing which exactly. is uh, probably the main issue uh, when we are uh, talking about contemporary architecture but even when they are not living authors uh, some sometimes they have been building a history for yes. themselves Absolutely. because in fact for example, we were looking into Le Corbusier, and of course, that you had shown something which is very iconic, which is the of complete that yeah. he has made, like something that exactly. was built by himself. Yeah. But not only that, but also, for example, uh, when he was building his own archive, because uh, we, as researchers, when we are dealing with Le Corbusier, we often have to go to Le Corbusier's foundation, yeah. that in fact yeah. is an archive that has been built by himself. Yeah. And as he was so obsessed with building it, and uh, while he was uh, making a train trip to somewhere, he just kept his uh, ticket so that we can better identify the, the day, the, mm. the hour when yeah. he has made that trip. That the same doesn't happen with other authors because they were not so, so much concerned with exactly. building a history and that's the case of Pierre Jeanneret, for example, exactly. which in fact we can also only um, go to that archive uh, not much time ago yeah. and uh, in fact it, it is not all digitized yeah. as in what uh, happens with Le Corbusier. Yeah. So sometimes uh, as researchers we, we are some kind of uh, 
uh, implied by authors Absolutely. themselves to tell the story that they want us to tell. So yeah. I was just but adding to so, no, no, I think it's, it's a fantastic remark and it's a remark you can say archives, we need to remember they are constructed. And any narrative, that's why I'm also so interested in post-colonial theory, is constructed as well. Also, what we get in oral history, obviously, is constructed as well. But there again, there I think, again, it's very, very important that we never take a single narrative for granted. That is this idea of the context zone, that we always, in our research, understand architecture as a context zone. So it can't be that we go to, uh, I'm staying at Le Corbusier for a moment, that we go to Le Corbusier and we ask him what is your uh, story and he will tell this heroic story of coming in Chandigarh and making a few sketches and so on. No, we need to cross it with other, other stories. For instance, the one of Pierre Jeanneret, for instance, the one of the Indian architects, in order to understand the complexity of that project as well, because it was, of course, not about a single man coming there with a sketch. But what I regret is that also, and I'm now looking to myself as somebody who's in, involved in historical research and teaching students the history of architecture and of urban design, is that we've been telling these stories very long in such a way, and I think many students thought, at least I've been educated like that, that, oh, doing architecture, that's coming to a site and making your sketch, and then after a few years or months, this project is there. That's of course not what architecture is about, quite on the contrary, it's a much more complex and layered matter. And so that is for me also uh, an invitation to researchers, but I'm even thinking that it could be extended to students when you're thinking about a project. A project for me is not only making the ideal form or the ideal, but it's maybe also thinking that your project will become part of a negotiation as well. So that could, in such a, will become part of a context, of a context. So, so maybe that is also something that we should speak more about with, with students as well, okay? We can make a, a design right now, but subsequently this, this design will be given to constructors. I mean, already very simply, what, what are the things that we need to keep fully under control? What are the things that they can negotiate in, in, in their construction? I think these issues are, are extremely, extremely important issues to, to discuss. So I'm just saying, because there are many students in the room here as well, it's not only a question of researchers, for us it's a very important question, I think, but it's also a question for students to think, what is architecture? What is an architectural project? Well, an architectural project is a context. <laughs> for me, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm, pushing it, uh, I'm pushing it a bit, and I'm wondering if in the conception of an architectural project we could work with, with that as well. I mean, I don't have all the, the final answers, and this is a bit of a... This is my story, and I mean, I'm only, you should only take it for, 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 that, for that as well. But I think it is something to, to reflect upon from my, uh, from my perspective. But you're right, and we always need to cross in, 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 in my mind to come back to you, because archives are very, very directive, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. and oral history can also be extremely directive, obviously. We had here in the first, uh, well, in the first seminar that we have organized on yeah. this. Thing about contemporary architecture, yeah. we had Tim Benton here with yeah. us, and he was using an expression. He was saying that you, we need to do a triangulation because yeah. whenever something happens, for example, if there is a car accident, you have one person that says that uh, the one car was going too fast, the other one is going yeah. that the other exactly. person was looking into the phone, the other person. Yeah. So everyone has his history. So yeah. uh, whenever we want to better understand what really happened. We yeah. have to listen yeah. to all the, yeah. the, the stories that are yeah. told in order to better yeah. understand that usually archives are uh, construction by one person. Absolutely. In fact, they have the name of the person. So. <laughs> yeah. And they are very often indeed very precisely constructed. Very, uh, I mean, they're visually constructs, let's say. I think it's our uh, role as, uh, as, our, as, as researchers, as architects, to, to deconstruct them. But I also think that this notion of the contact zone is important to tell to people who are not architects, to tell them about the complexity of our, of our trade uh, as well. Because, I mean, we need to negotiate these contact zones as architects as well. All of us who have ever been in touch with, with practice uh, know that, no, I mean, that it's... it's so uh, I think this, this complexity is something that we need to make part of our narrative again. I mean, we as architects, it's not only about, uh, you know, drawing something that 
let's say, looks aesthetically uh, beautiful or, or what do I know, but it's about thinking about something that can be negotiated and, and then in the end will hopefully be realized as a result of that negotiation as well. So that's this notion of this, uh, of this contact. So. Thank you very much for your great contribution to the understanding of architecture. I think this is very helpful, um, especially for the students. I mean, I, I, I look at these three themes that you, you, you presented and shared with us, and I think, that, as Marta was saying, being very useful for our, uh, our course. was all about the first the first slide. So <laughs> it was just like, you know, what, what what's between an idea and a beautiful image of a building on Instagram? Yeah. And what, what what needs to be done, you know, and all this process about yeah. the complexity of the work, the interactions you need to have, the failures, the, the frustration, yeah. all this is part of the process. And it's very important for students and as you were saying now, for everybody that is involved, I mean from clients and people on the other side to understand the value of work, I mean the input that we need to give and all Absolutely. the players in this process, Absolutely. the value of work that you know that we need to uh, uh, bring more in to the attention uh, uh, of yeah. everyone. Because it, it's it's very important. I mean I shared I shared uh, images of uh, uh, meetings and the uh, schedule of meetings and, and in the, the setbacks of all the projects. I mean I, I've shared all the detailed drawings and the Mm. All, you know, the work on site, what yeah. needs to be done to get the wall done, and yeah. the render, I mean, the whole process. And uh, I just, I did, I haven't shared the work uh, that we've been doing in the office for some time, and I just realized that we've been doing so much stuff, you know, yeah. that we yeah. don't know, we, that we didn't realize about it. Yeah. And this is very important. Absolutely, I, I fully, I mean, it's a pity that I didn't see your lecture no, no, no. Uh, yeah, 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 yesterday, because I mean, for me also, it, it's really also, let's say, revealing indeed the amount of work, the complexity of the, of the work, the complexity of the negotiation in these contact zones, and, and, and understanding that this is part of the trade and part of, the, of, what, of what needs to be done as well, and thus, to my taste, again, as, a, as somebody who's, who's doing research, I mean, we are obliged to also tell these uh, these, these stories. I mean, that's... Uh, and this, as uh, we're commenting here on the yeah. side, it, it is not about diluting the authorship of the work. No, not at all. It's, uh, it's actually uh, uh, explaining and sharing the experience that we can gain and the authorship and, uh, and uh, uh, especially that once you start growing in your practice, and what, how much you learn from the experience that you get from all these interactions, this is what makes you a, a, a more knowledgeable architect, you know, more... Absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and this is absolutely, it's important to, to, to acknowledge that this comes from these interactions and this experience. That's, that's why it is my subtitle to another definition yeah. of architectural yeah. authorship, yeah. because for me it's not about going away of architectural yeah. authorship, quite, quite on the contrary, but I think it's to understand authorship differently, again, that, than the single, male, heroic, fully, con fully conceptual uh, 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 authorship. I mean, it's trying to, I think, to, to my taste, it's almost like thickening the, our understanding of, of, of what authorship in, in, architecture, in architecture means. And uh, yeah, I think it's also good to discuss this with students. It's difficult, much more difficult than this than this simplistic uh, view on, uh, yeah, like, on, 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 on on authorship. Yeah. But I think it is worthwhile to to have that discussion also with our with our students in the in the design studios in the in the seminars. So not only with PhD uh, candidates, but also with with uh, well bachelor and master uh, students to understand. Yeah, I mean. This is part of the trade, part of our authorship, so we, we also must probably need to, uh, well, need to understand that and need to um, get skills in, in, in that and to a certain extent as well, as far, in as far as we can do that within education. That's our problem. And, and then to close, yeah. I mean, yeah. the second chapter yeah. is, is really what I'm trying to investigate now, <laughs> which is really important that yeah. we, we rarely pay attention, which yeah. is the way the builders are perceived. Exactly. And used, and, used so, yeah. and this is absolutely yeah. important and for the knowledge into, yeah. to bring back this into design. Yeah. And, and what I'm particularly interested in, that's why I'm combining them. So I'm, I hope that I got that across. I mean, I'm interested in, in the interrelation between what we design and how they are used, perceived, and so on. Because I think, and for me, of course, as an architect, 
we, we operate mainly in this in this realm. So I'm particularly interested in that relation. So in the in the five or six cities that I was investigating, as I tried to show you, it was always about this interrelation. How did what the architect maybe and with, in this negotiation with many others uh, came up with in the first place? How did that then inform what what people could or could not do in in the in the perceived and in the lift uh, in the lift uh, uh, space? Sorry, I mean. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I will go for the third uh, <laughs> <laughs> sentence. Left it to you. Uh, and we didn't uh, uh, have a strategy. <laughs> but I was very intrigued by the, the, the possibility of the embedded hypothesis. And I have a question, Tom, which is, um, can we go on a pure state to it? Because yeah. uh, being trained as architects, so the second one that you presented, it's yeah. already in us. Uh, by defect, by default, by default right? Yeah. So my question is about methodology. Yeah. How can we go to the embedded hypothesis, yeah. uh, being trained as we are? Yeah. Well, uh, we, are, we of course all always go to it in a predetermined uh, yeah. uh, way. Let's say. I mean, I can immediately give that, <laughs> give, give, give that away. And I think it's even a quality. Now, now, I'm, now I'm coming to my point because I think that for me, what we as architects can do is look at urban ensembles like I was showing here in the La Tourette housing complex and read these, uh, these, uh, uh, these complexes. I think that uh, that's not something in my mind that a sociologist or an economist can do or maybe then in a very different way than, than we can do. But I think we have capacities as architects to read buildings, neighborhoods, cities. And what I, I have the feeling that at least in, in, in the world that I'm functioning that, that reading buildings, understanding their, what I'm calling these embedded hypotheses, is that that's something that we've forgotten. I mean, so people are focusing enormously, you know, on big political, cultural, uh, social on, on, on the understandings, projecting that on buildings, neighborhoods, uh, cities, but they forget to look at the buildings, the, the neighborhoods and the cities themselves. But you're right, I mean, we, can, we always come with our biases, but we also come with our knowledge, that's my point. Our knowledge as architects, to be able to read these built environments and to understand, even though this was not part of a big political discourse about reconstruction or the, or the welfare state, there are certain assumptions, certain hypotheses in these buildings that we can make part of our, of our story as, as researchers as well. But of course, we always come with biases, but we do in any case. I mean, we always come with, with, with a set of biases. Uh, and I think the best thing to do is to also announce these biases when you start your research, that you say, hey, I'm coming I'm here, here as a, I'm here I am, this is my positionality, as we called it in the English uh, ideal, and I'm starting my, uh, my, my research. I'm most often also doing that right now quite explicitly. Even when I'm starting a lecture, I'm saying, okay, where do I come from? Uh, so that people know, I mean, that I think it's, it becomes more and more uh, used to, to do that. But I said that for me, the reason that I would, would want to speak about this is because I think it's so important that we as architects don't forget to look at the artifacts mm -hmm. and the implicit, the embedded, uh, the embedded hypotheses that are there in these artifacts. And I think we have the capacity to reveal them, to bring them, to bring them to the surface. I, just one, I will give you a uh, because, um, well, I have your books, but uh, I especially go uh, again and again to the Chandigar Casablanca one. Uh, I find it very deep and it's very interesting because uh, you were probably uh, one of the first uh, researchers to give us uh, the two sides of the mirror and to state simultaneously that they can be simultaneously fascinating. Yeah. I mean, the conceptual level of the projects, yeah. but also the life that uh, sprung from from the reality, actually, yeah, it's the world. Sure. And it, this is not so common in uh, uh, architectural surveys. Uh, I mean, this is the lecture that you gave yeah. itself, but yeah. now, finally, it's happening. Yeah. Uh, so. My question is a bit about your own biography. So, how did that came up to you? This uh, interest in the other side of the mirror. So, in the 
I, I, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> I've, never, I've never been that uh, self uh, psych, psychoanalysis. But, 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 I, but I think um, but, uh, but the first thing that comes to mind to me is that um, I, I worked, I started to work in a city like uh, Casablanca in 1997. I was there for the first time. That's when I started my, my research uh, there. And um, what I remember is that I was enormously amazed about the agency, not of the urban designers, of, who, of whom I had read before, but the agency of the people, I would say. The way that they had been transforming their houses. I showed you this vertical, these vertical extensions. And so, in, in that sense, I think it almost came as a as a challenge. I mean, I had, I had thought to go there and to see these pristine white modern buildings of which I had read in the historical publications. And I came there and I, I didn't recognize it. I mean, it, it, was, it were not these pristine modern buildings, but it was something that was completely alter, changed, transformed. And then, of course, you become aware, well, it, there are other actors and other agencies at stake in this, in this neighborhood as well. And that made me then uh, explore what is that? But I must say, this notion of the contact zone, that's a more, a more, recent, a more recent development that I'm also trying to theorize, conceptualize. Okay, wouldn't this be something that I can methodologically not only use in my own research, but also could offer to other researchers to work with this notion of the contact zone as something that allows us to tell different narratives about architecture, about planning, urban design, and, and, and so on. So, but I think that. If I, a, quick, a quick answer would be indeed this encounter with, this, with the agency of these other actors in the built environment. It's something that I had never seen in Europe because I've been studying housing projects in France, for instance, from exactly the same period. And then you go, for instance, to Toulouse and Mirai, and you go to Toulouse and Mirai, you see the blocks, they're still the same as in the 1960s when they were, when, when they were uh, built, let's say, or largely, largely the same. But then I came in Casablanca and I mean, I didn't recognize the neighborhood uh, any longer and that made me aware, I would say, of these other actors, of these other agents, I would, I would say. That's quick. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I was thinking about, one, replacing the idea of the genius, the yeah. genius, the, the solitary yeah. genius, by this idea of multiplicity of network of interconnection. Yeah. Obviously, it challenges the way to do research, the way to yeah. construct and everything else, but it also challenges um, the mechanisms and the places of celebration today. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And, and I would like to, to hear uh, a little bit about it. And I have a second uh, question I was wondering about. How does it work, the idea of authorship in, in nowadays, uh, post digital world, yeah. in which uh, the tangibility that yeah. you were talking about, yeah. about the buildings, about yeah. the constructive process, and about this idea of artifact. Yeah. It does not matter anymore, yeah. and it has not place. It has not tangibility. That's your two, 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 two very good, <laughs> two very, two very good uh, questions. The first, the first question I would like to um, let's say quickly answer. One of the things that I also learned from post-colonial theory, you could maybe see quickly in some of the quotes of uh, Edward Said, is that indeed uh, these systems, these cultural systems. And I consider architectural culture, of course, also a cultural system. And the definitions, for instance, of authorship in these cultural systems, they are very, very persistent. And they are kept alive by different mechanisms. By architectural criticism, by the prizes that we give, like the Pritzker Prize that we give to a single uh, a star uh, uh, architect. Uh, but not the Aga Khan. The Aga Khan yeah, exactly. Is voilà. Voilà. Voilà, so, so there are of course there are of course alternatives, but there are also quite a bit of system or yeah, elements, uh, platforms that are that are confirming this idea of uh, this idea of authorship. So that's one thing to say. But of course, I mean, as always, these systems they can be broken, altered, uh, transformed. Obviously, obviously as well. The second thing that you're asking, Ruth, that's a very difficult one because that's of course the question of authorship in relation to the digital uh, to the digital realm where maybe the artifact is not... I see two things there. First of all, 
very often when you speak about authorship and when you deal with models, with drawings, it was relatively easy to recognize the, uh, the who's, who was authoring, because you could uh, um, recognize what they call in French the écriture, the, 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 well, the way of drawing, the way of writing, the way of modeling, you could, the signature you could say, of, in, in that sense of, 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 of somebody as well. And there, I think, as far as I know, in the digital realm, this is disappearing. This idea of signature, uh, uh, um, écriture, as, 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 they, as they call it in, in, in French. And also, indeed, because much of the, the digital work is never going to be... Uh, there's maybe no real embedded hypothesis because there's no artifact uh, there. Yeah, that I need to say. I don't, I don't, have, an, I don't have an answer. I think it, it becomes... We're in a different realm, and we will need to think again about how to how to approach it. So that's maybe good for to, to tell to everybody as well that I'm still very much talking about rather conventional architecture. You could uh, you could uh, say, and so it's about buildings, it's about neighborhoods, it's about cities that are realized, that are built. I mean, so there I think you you touched upon uh, an open an open question. I would I would say. Thank you so much for your uh, lecture. Uh, I'm a PhD, uh, PhD student, so I'm starting uh, to research uh, as a student. Uh, and uh, I'm, much, I'm talking about uh, my case. I'm very much identifying what you're, uh, uh, you were showing, like a methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking like a very strong uh, authorship uh, uh, project to investigate. So. And I was trying to like uh, search for other paths, other uh, variants to the equation. And yeah. So this fits like uh, perfection. Happy to hear. <laughs> uh, it's true. Uh, well, as I was like searching for other answers to my question, other questions, mm -hmm. I always think it's I always think it's like uh, we're doing like a journalist uh, work. It's like. But in history, we're like mm -hmm. investigating past facts, mm -hmm. and we're trying to cross histories. It's exactly what uh, journalists uh, are doing. Possibly, yeah. Um, um, maybe, maybe you're right. Yeah, maybe journalism, the principle of, of crossing sources, uh, you, you refer to most probably. If you never take one source for granted, that you cross uh, sources. Yeah, maybe there's a parallel. I never, I never thought, I never thought about about that. Um, Let's say, if you look at my three contact zones, I assume that this is going a bit further than what normally uh, journalism is, is doing, and it's a bit more detailed, but the basic principle of crossing sources, you're, you're, you're right. I don't know what that says about history, then, that for a very long time history didn't cross uh, sources and just relied on a single source. That's then maybe another question that we can ask ourselves. I've never, I've never thought about it, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting remark. I think uh, if you look at the three sort of contact zones here, that most probably I'm pointing to, eh, for instance, when we talk about these embedded hypotheses, I don't think that a, a journalist could do that, in my, in my understanding. I think we need architects uh, to, uh, to, uh, to do that. And I also think that that's the unique thing that we can bring to the table in relation to maybe people who are, let's say, more uh, general historians or even art historians, I, I think we could bring something, uh, something there as well to my taste. That's without saying that what general historians and art historians are doing is of course also very important. But if we want to, let's say, um, I think that in all of these there are very, very specific things that we as architects can, uh, can do because we understand these negotiations between different actors because we we know that this is, of course, one of the main issues that we need to think about between the conceived and the perceived, and because we also have this capacity to reveal this embedded hypothesis, I would say. So there is something a bit specific, architectural, I would, I would say. But you're right, as a general figure. It's, it's yeah? like it's a, yeah. it has a parallel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Thank you. No, I, I think you, you offered us a very a useful uh, framework to look at uh, our discipline uh, in the sense that we can go over that uh, over simplification that we are used yeah. to. Well, but going back to to, to authorship, yeah. you know, that was the main question. Yeah. You know, 
presentation. Well, in, in law nowadays, and going back to what Ruth was mentioning, there's a very uh, clear uh, the, uh, concept of, of the two degrees of authorship. Uh, yeah. You have moral rights yeah. and you have a, a material rights, and that is uh, pretty much uh, clear in, in law uh, yeah. already. And we are probably moving towards uh, uh, more of moral rights rather than material rights yeah. of, 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 uh, above the object, since the object in architecture it's no longer yours after it's uh, delivered. Yeah. Well, but, uh, uh, my question is that uh, are we not moving towards uh, the architect uh, as uh, an agent uh, rather than a, a producer of, of artifacts? In the sense that if we are uh, more con conducting the processes rather than, mm -hmm. than, than uh, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that the object is the one that we can see. Yeah, yeah. You, you're putting it very black. Thanks for your question and also for the remark on, on, uh, on authorship. I will, I will need to think about this, this differentiation if it's, if it's applicable for us. But what, what, for us in our field, but what I think is, I wouldn't put it so black and white. I mean, because I think I'm a bit against, so I'm not at all believing that we as architects should become the leaders of processes, uh, let's say. Or to say it differently, maybe we become agents in processes, but I do think that we still need to give a very, very clear role to design in these processes as well. So, for instance, one of the reasons that I'm speaking, as you can see, when I'm speaking about these multiple actors, I'm not saying that, is, that, that the, the architect or the urban designer is no longer designing. Quite on the, con quite on the contrary, I think we are designing. But it might be that we understand our designs in a different way. Our designs are not blueprints that are subsequently organized in almost uh, as good as possible as a blueprint. But maybe our designs become something part of the negotiation. And I think that that's really... So don't misunderstand me. I'm not making a plea that I really must say very, very clearly. I'm not making a plea for understanding architecture as something that is fully process-oriented. I do think that design, precise design, is, is of utmost importance, only I don't think that we should look upon design as an idealized blueprint which is then uh, needlessly going to be realized uh, out, uh, out there, let's say. And that's why I'm also interested in this, eh, the conceived and the perceived. I want to understand the relation. This is the realm in which we are op operating. I want to understand the relation with the perceived lift, uh, let's say. That's why I'm also <laughs> interested in, in this. So I think we need to, of course, our, our, our field of intervention to me is design. That's to me very, very clearly. But the question is how do we understand the design or the design project, I could, I could say as, uh, as well. I would suggest that we look upon the design project as part of the different context roles that I, that I sketched uh, here uh, for you. And as a, as a, as a very, very strong agent, if I may mis misuse that word one more time, as a very, very strong agent in these, in these context zones as well. So that's the suggestion. Don't forget about design. Don't believe that architecture is uh, only, uh, we are not managers, I think. We are not, um, I don't see the future for, for architecture uh, there. But I do believe that we can look upon our projects in a, in a, in a different way. As something that is more negotiated, as something I, can, I would even imagine to me in, in, a, in a design studio it would be good that students understand, okay, I'm drawing this uh, right now, but this is going to become part of a negotiation with constructors, with... Uh, and that might inform even a design attitude, I, I, I think, as well, to my, uh, to my taste. Uh, I think it has always been, uh, I mean, uh, try to think about the way that we detail a building. Typically, when you, when you detail a building, you take into consideration, hey, somebody will, somebody will do the wall, somebody will do the floor, and in order to bring these two together, I need to think about a very particular detail. And to me, the detail is a negotiation between these two, two agents, I would say. So I think it has always been, but maybe we need to heighten our understanding of this negotiated character. That's what I... Would, would, suggest, would suggest. <laughs> okay, if there is no more questions.
Stalmar Van Rotten. Thank you. Thank you.